That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, to, to wrap up our afternoon, we have Lauren Steinberg here from Temple University to tell us about healthy development for adolescents. He's the author of a great book. It's called The Age of Opportunity. Uh, Larry, welcome. Okay. Um, so in the 20 minutes that I have, what I'm hoping to do is to change the way that you think about adolescence and change that conceptualization of adolescence forever. Um, there's a problem with the way that we think about adolescence in our society, and it's easily revealed if you go to a local bookstore or an online bookseller and you look for books on how to raise teenagers. And uh, here's what you see. Um, born to be wild, yes, your teen is crazy, get out of my life, dial down the drama, have a new teenager by Friday. That's really a nice message to be sending to parents. And I like to think of these books as more or less survival guides. And if you dig a little bit deeper, what you see is an astounding number of books that have the word survive or survival in the title. So this is a currently very popular book. Um, the neuroscience in it is very good. But look at the subtitle, A Neuroscientist's Survival Guide to Raising Adolescents and Young Adults. And it's not just neuroscientists who have this perspective on kids. Um, here's a survival guide to the adolescent brain for you and your teen. It's a cross-species phenomenon. <laughs> the way that we think about adolescence. I didn't, this is a real book. I didn't make this up. Um, we need a new way of thinking about adolescence. It's not working very well. Um, and I think we need it for a number of reasons. But one of the most important is that adolescence is longer today than it's ever been in human history. It's been stretched out at both ends. It starts earlier because of the increasingly declining age at which people go through puberty in the developed world. And it's stretched out at the end because of the delayed transition that young people are making into the conventional roles of adulthood. So by my estimation, adolescence today in America lasts about 15 years long. That's three times as long as it was in the 19th century and about twice as long as it was in the 1950s. Now maybe when adolescence was a short period of time, we could get through it by just surviving. But you can't just survive if it's a 15 year period. So we need a new vision of adolescence as parents and as educators and as journalists. And I think that we can find that new vision in science. The reason I think this is so important is that if you think about experiences in your life day to day, that you go into thinking, the best I'm going to do is survive, you're not going to invest very much in trying to make that a better experience. You're just going to hold your breath until it's over. And we have convinced people, I think, that adolescence is the root canal of parenting. It's the time that you go in and you just hold your breath and you hope that nothing terrible happens. And I think that we can look to the science of adolescence and the science of adolescent brain development for an alternative model, an alternative to the idea that the best we can do by our kids is just to survive this period of time. And so if there's one word that captures it, well, here. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir. You. Plastics. So, there are two periods in human development when the brain is exquisitely plastic. Plasticity is the word that neuroscientists use to refer to the fact that the brain is capable of changing in response to experience. And we heard earlier this afternoon about the plasticity of the first, I was going to say the first three years of life, but I'll say the first two years of life. We know the brain is very plastic. And that understanding has motivated 
uh, a lot of terrific work on early childhood education, on higher quality child care, on prenatal care, because we know that the experiences that babies and toddlers have affect their brains forever. But a new revelation is that there's a second period of heightened brain plasticity, and that period is adolescence. That's really important to keep in mind as we think about designing our institutions for young people. The brain becomes much more plastic at the beginning of adolescence, and it loses a tremendous amount of plasticity at the end of adolescence. Now, all of our brains right now are still a little bit plastic. If they weren't, we wouldn't be able to learn anything. But the way in which the brain is plastic in adulthood is very different than the way in which it's plastic during adolescence and during childhood. Because during adolescence and childhood, the brain is building whole new brain circuits. And it's eliminating unnecessary ones. But once adolescence is done, once we enter into adulthood, the brain plasticity that we see involves minor tweaks to existing brain circuits. So adolescence is the last period in human development when the brain will ever be that plastic again. That makes it a tremendous opportunity. But we don't think about adolescence as an opportunity because we're too busy just surviving it. The brain becomes plastic at the beginning of adolescence because of puberty. We tend to think of puberty as mainly affecting our sexual development and our sex drive and our external appearance. And of course, it does all of those things. But we now understand that sex hormones have a tremendous impact on the brain. And one of the effects of exposing the brain to sex hormones at the beginning of puberty is to make the brain more plastic. This involves changing the brain circuitry. It involves helping to build new brain circuits and eliminate unnecessary circuits through the process of synaptic pruning. Now, when the brain is plastic, it is not malleable in all parts of the brain, in all brain systems, at the same time. Different periods of life are periods of differential plasticity for different parts of the brain. So take the visual cortex of the brain, for example. Highly plastic very early in life, and then it loses most of its plasticity. As you probably know if you've raised a child, children aren't born with 20-20 vision. They improve in their ability to see things during the first year, year and a half of life, and then it stops improving. You don't become better at seeing things as you get older after that. You can try all kinds of things, but it won't improve your vision, and that's because that part of the brain is no longer as plastic as it was early in life. There are other regions of the brain that stay plastic longer, but not forever. So language learning is an example of something that's much easier to do before adolescence than after adolescence. Much easier to learn a second language as a child than it is as a teenager or as an adult. And that's because that region of the brain loses a lot of its plasticity as we develop from childhood into adolescence. So when we talk about the brain being plastic in adolescence, we need to ask, where is it plastic? And one part of the brain that stays plastic for a very long time is the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is important for a number of different functions. One is it, that is, uh, it, it regulates higher order thinking abilities, what we call executive functions, like thinking ahead and logical reasoning. But another um, a function of the prefrontal cortex is that it governs self-regulation. The ability for us to exercise voluntary control over our thoughts and our feelings and our actions. I say that because self-regulation is one of the most important traits that there is for predicting success in life. And by success, I don't just mean success in school, although it does predict that. I mean success in the labor force, in our social relationships. Hundreds of studies have been done that show that children who, are, who have strong self-regulation have better mental health, 
they're happier, they're less likely to get into trouble. This is a little girl participating in a famous study that you probably all know about called the Marshmallow Study. The Marshmallow Study was a study that was done at Stanford University more than 50 years ago in which they were able to classify children on the basis of whether they could delay gratification and wait for a second marshmallow instead of eating uh, the first one that they were offered. Those people have been followed up over time. So they were tested as children, as teenagers, as young adults, and now they're middle-aged adults, and they're still being studied. The kids who had better self-regulation when they were three years old accumulated more years of schooling. They had better jobs. They had higher SAT scores. They were less likely to develop a substance abuse problem. They were less likely to be obese. They were less likely to be arrested. Self-regulation is probably the most important capacity we can help facilitate in our young people. One of the reasons it's so important to help build self-regulation during adolescence is that adolescence is a time, as a couple of the speakers have said, um, when kids are very prone to take risks. Self-regulation helps temper that inclination. And the fact that the prefrontal cortex is the seat of self-regulation and that the prefrontal cortex is still plastic during adolescence gives us a tremendous opportunity to help build this critical capacity. I told you that puberty makes the brain more plastic. It has another effect on the brain as well. It increases activity involving the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine serves many, many purposes in the brain, but one very critical one is the experience of pleasure. So when we are rewarded for something, or when we anticipate getting a reward for something, we get a little dopamine squirt, if you think of it that way. And it doesn't matter what the reward is. It can be food, it can be sex, it can be money, it can be praise. But dopamine plays a role in our experience of that phenomenon as pleasurable. Puberty increases dopamine activity in the brain's reward centers. That's one of the effects that sex hormones have on the brain. And as a consequence of that, there's more dopamine activity in the brain's reward centers during adolescence than at any other point in development. That means two things. That means that during adolescence, things that feel good feel even better. And it also means that for the rest of your life, nothing will ever feel as good to you as it did when you were a teenager. Now, when rewards feel so good, you're on the lookout for them. And you're willing to do things to go after them, even if they might be somewhat dangerous. And so adolescence is a time when kids engage in a lot of sensation seeking, in the pursuit of reward, in the pursuit of pleasure. Some of this sensation seeking is terrific, but some of it is dangerous. Adolescence is a time when the accelerator is pressed down to the floor before a good braking system is in place. And this mismatch between an easily aroused reward system and still developing self-control causes kids to do a lot of risky and reckless things. Now, risk-taking during adolescence is not inherently a bad thing. We want our kids to take certain kinds of risks. We want them to try out for the school play. We want them to take classes that they're not guaranteed getting an A in. We want them to tell somebody they like about the crush that they have on them. And those are all risks that we want our kids to engage in. So we don't want kids to not take risks. And in fact, risk taking during adolescence is built into our evolutionary history. When animals move into the juvenile period, they leave the natal environment. And they go out to become independent. And that's a very dangerous thing to do to leave the adults that have taken care of you and have raised you for this long. And it's a risky thing to do. And we think that we are wired neurobiologically to be more willing to take risks during adolescence because if we weren't able to do this, we wouldn't become independent and we wouldn't reproduce. So we can't stop our kids from wanting to take risks. What we can do 
is help build their self-regulatory abilities so that the risks they take are good ones, are healthy ones, are the ones that we would like them to take. I've written a lot about the implications of this research for education, where we're not doing a very good job in building self-regulation, one of those important non-cognitive skills we hear about, for public health, because what passes for health education in the United States is almost entirely ineffective because kids know that they shouldn't have unprotected sex and they know that they shouldn't drive recklessly and they know that they shouldn't smoke, but they do those things anyway because telling them not to do them doesn't help. Um, and a lot of the work I do is in the juvenile justice system because understanding this mismatch between reward seeking and self-regulation has helped courts rethink what adolescence is as a developmental period and what an appropriate response is when kids break the law. So there are some things we can do to help build self-regulation. Um, mindfulness has been shown to stimulate prefrontal development and help build self-regulation. Exposing kids to challenge and novelty in school, that's not the same as stress. That's exposing them to challenge. That helps build self-regulation. Practicing a type of parenting that we've called authoritative parenting, which is combining being warm and involved with being firm and having expectations that are well articulated. Kids who grow up in authoritative households perform much better on tasks of self-regulation than kids who grew up in households that are too indulgent or too dictatorial. Aerobic exercise turns out to be very good for your brain. I'm sure most people in this room have a regimen of exercise that they try to stick to. And you do that not only because it's good for you physically, but because you know that it's good for you mentally as well. And yet, lots of public schools in the United States, as Lawrence just talked about the, uh, the, the short amount of time uh, uh, kids are allowed for recess, lots of public schools in the United States have virtually eliminated physical education from their day-to-day -day activities. We've reserved it for the star athletes who are on the varsity teams. Teenagers need an hour of aerobic exercise a day. And that's good for their physical well-being, but it's good for their brain development and therefore their mental well-being. And then finally, sleep. Sleep is fundamentally important for the development of self-regulatory abilities. Teenagers need eight hours of sleep a night. Very few of them in the United States get it. I know that you probably think that it is natural and normal for teenagers to have to stay up late because you read about the shift in their circadian rhythms that take place with puberty. That's not really the story. What the story is, is that puberty changes the brain, it changes the sleep cycle in ways that make it easier to stay up if you want to stay up. It doesn't make you have to stay up. And if there are things in the teenager's bedroom that entice her to not go to sleep, she now has the biological capability of resisting the urge to fall asleep. And one of the reasons that kids are sleep deprived is that school starts too early, we know that, um, and school districts that have changed their school start time to a later time, even just by an hour, have seen improvements in kids' performance and behavior. Um, but kids need sleep in order to develop this self-regulatory competence. So the message that I want to leave you with here is that adolescence is not just a time to survive. That adolescence is a time when people can really thrive. We just need to take advantage of the opportunity that the burst of brain plasticity that occurs at puberty provides. We're not taking advantage of it now, and I hope you will help in your work to get the message out that we need to think about adolescence in an entirely different way. Thank you. <laughs>